Toronto is the home of the biggest community of stem cell researchers in the world. Let me ask you, do stem cells hold the cure for cancers, heart disease, diabetes, and other diseases that kill millions each year? I believe they do. The McEwen Center is committed to accelerated discovery, funding targeted stem cell research from basic science to transformational outcomes in a two-year time frame. We are impatient and we want results. I applaud you for being here today to hear our esteemed panel and very courageous advocates. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. It's a great turnout on a beautiful day. I'm happy you're here and I'm happy to be able to give you the first three or four slides on what a stem cell is, why scientists are interested in it. This is basic science that you'll be uh, learning about today. We need stem cells for two very important reasons. One, to develop. These are the cells that bring us from an embryonic state to adulthood, to the fully developed animal. The second thing that stem cells do, and this is what provides most of the excitement for the scientific community, is that they help us regenerate. So as we get older and as we encounter injuries and disease during our lifetimes, these are the cells that are most responsible for renewal. Skin, if we didn't have stem cells, our skin would fall off in three weeks. Blood, our blood stem cells are prodigious powerhouses, building millions and billions of cells every second. What stem cells do? One is that they make more of themselves. So stem cells are very unique in their properties of a uh, capacity called self-renewal. They make another stem cell of exactly the same type. The second very important property of stem cells is that they differentiate or change into a multiplicity of cell types. But the important properties of stem cells is that they have capacity to move into the next cell down the line and eventually become the cells that make up all of the cells and tissues of our body. Now, I'm going to go over three types of stem cells. There are many subtypes that scientists study, but these are the main ones for the purposes of, of tonight's discussion. First is embryonic stem cells. These are cells that come from the two to four day old human embryo. These embryos are very, very small, about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. A second type of cell is something that is revolutionized stem cell biology. This is called induced pluripotent cells. They can be made from regular skin cells or indeed any adult stem cell or any adult cell in the body. And it's simply a matter of introducing genes into these cells, which then reprogram the genes as if you, as if you were reprogramming a computer to an embryonic state. So the difference in this method from the first method I showed you is that no embryos are used. The third type of stem cell is called the adult stem cell. This is actually a misnomer because these cells occur during fetal development, but we call them adult stem cells as a matter of uh, art, really, and because they persist with us throughout adulthood. They are interesting to us because they arise as most cell type or all cell types do from embryonic stem cells. So if you're thinking of a family tree, think of it this way. The embryo, embryonic stem cells make all of the cell types in the body, including adult stem cells that are found in various tissues, nooks and crannies of the body. So this is just a basic diagram that shows where some of the adult stem cells are located. So if you think about the major diseases that we're faced with, um, you can see that these capture pretty much all of them. First off, thank you all for having me. It's a joy to be here among such great champions of science, which is too important. So September 10th, 1994, was my day to live in infamy. The day that I was a football player, and I went in to make one more tackle, and I didn't get up from that in one tackle. I was paralyzed. C5, C6, the doctors told me when they came in my room, you'll never move your arms, you'll never move your legs, you'll never father a child. I said, F you, get out of my room. 
through tons of hard work, I've been able to get my arms back and benching 300 pounds. And through some really fun work, I have three great children, so that's, uh, that's really great. But the thing that's most important to me is finding a cure. We gotta find a cure. Like it or not, we are all patient advocates here today. For whatever reason, you are all patient advocates. You all can take a stand. So please, take a stand for research. Take a stand for stem cells. Take a stand so one day everybody can. Thank you. It was not long after my injury, in fact, uh, within weeks, when I first started hearing about spinal cord research. And it, for the first few years, I showed up where I could and I, I said a few words about spinal cord research and the importance of it. But I realized I was paying lip service to it until in 1996, Christopher Reeve was coming to Toronto and I was given an assignment to write a feature about whether his goal of standing at age 50 was realistic. And for the first time, I had to really listen to what the scientists were saying because I had to write about it. And I remember feeling excitement that I had not allowed myself to feel up until that point. And I will say that if the whole enchilada was for me to be walking, running, dancing again, I gave up the whole enchilada a long time ago and I'm okay with that. But with a little bit of arm movement, I could eat on my own, I could drive, I could pat my dog, I could be independent in a way that I have not been since 18. So I'm all for clinical research, let's move it ahead. Thanks a lot. It's remarkable to think that um, about 90% of what we know about spinal cord injury, brain injury, and repair and regeneration of the nervous system has been learned in the last 20 years. And we're really in a remarkable era right now in, in the setting of regenerative medicine, and particularly in regenerative neuroscience, where the ability to actually repair and rebuild the injured brain and spinal cord has become a reality. So the spinal cord is an electrical structure. It contains nerve fibers or axons, and they fire electrically. There is an insulating layer called the myelin, which um, is important in terms of signal transmission. And there's a specialized area of the axon called the node of Rambia. This is where the action potentials, the electrical signals fire. And the myelin is attached by specialized molecules to the axon. After spinal cord injury, even in someone with a really severe uh, uh, injury, there is some preservation of the outer rim of the spinal cord. The inner part admittedly does undergo necrosis and, and, and cell death. What happens though in the periphery is that there's a loss of the myelinating, myelinating cells, the oligodendrocytes. As a result of this, you lose the insulating layer and the normal molecular arrangement of these neurofibers is disturbed. And so as a result of this, even though there's some preserved structure, there's no electrical conduction. So the concept here is to use the patient's own spinal cord as a scaffold to go in with specialized neural stem cells that will be transformed into these myelinating cells. They will then track along the axons and then to, tr to try to rebuild the myelin sheath, thereby restoring uh, electrical uh, conduction. And the basic science behind this is really very uh, compelling. And this is the, the, the level of science that has now been evaluated by the, uh, by the FDA and has been deemed to be at a level where going into phase one trials has been deemed uh, uh, ethical. So in the area of spinal cord injury, there's a lot of debate. You know, is the level of knowledge there where we should be uh, moving forward? Uh, is it safe? Um, is it ethical? Um, and, and, and you know, and this is an extremely important debate, but truthfully, we never really have all the knowledge it, that, that, that um, in order to have the answers to all of the questions. So at some point, we need to pull the trigger, if you will, and to launch into clinical trials. But what's important is that those clinical trials be done in the most rigorous fashion, 
and that we, ga we gain important data. But this, this concept of both forward and reverse translation is extremely important so that we can push things further. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess I'm sitting here in front of everyone not as an expert, I'd like to get that out of the way, but as an example. Because um, the only reason that I'm sitting here today is a direct result of my stem cell transplant. In 2009, I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. And uh, the first question I had, of course, was, what is it? I've never heard of it. And uh, my hematologist said, well, it's incurable, but we hope that, you know, after a certain protocol of treatment, you'll uh, qualify for a stem cell transplant, and that should hopefully buy you a nice long remission. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, oh, the other thing he told me is he said, whatever you do, when you go home, don't Google it. <laughs> so it was alarming. Um, however, I had my own coping tech kind of mechanisms that kind of kicked into, into play, and of course, being in the creative arts. I, I ended up um, writing uh, about my cancer journey, and for me, uh, opened up an entire world. It, it really... Um, taught me um, this really significant lesson, which is that you don't receive support if you don't ask for it, or broadly speaking, if you don't cry out for it. So that was the first step of my, I think, um, of my journey. So after about four months, I was told that uh, we had beat back the beast far enough into the cage that I would qualify for a stem cell transplant. It was, it's a two-part series. The first day, I was nuked. You know, it's, as far as I say it, you're being taken to the brink and then being brought back. So I was nuked a really, really high dose of chemo. And we had a little chart and we'd watch my white blood cell count drop from day to day to day to day to day until it went to zero, basically bottomed out. So I had no immunity. Second day, I was reinfused with my own stem cells. They engraft and miracle of miracles, Lisa, what I call Lisa 2.0 was born. And I was privileged enough to do a tour of the McEwen Center to go into the labs to see what's going on. And oh my God, everybody should care. What I saw going on in those labs has resonance for every single person in this room. And if not for you directly, for somebody that you know and you love. Well, Lisa, I think, gave you a vibrant testimony about uh, transplantation. And you have to appreciate that in the field of hematology, this is now mainstream, mainstream therapy. There's about 40,000 procedures that are done worldwide every year. But you have to ask the question, how did that all start? Well, it was a spark that we didn't really want to see. The sparks in 1945 in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that resulted in death, that resulted in our appreciation that radiation is fatal, and it could be fatal by direct application or by the fact that marrows are completely destroyed and are not functioning, that patients do not have the ability to produce any blood cells. And indeed, it was very soon that researchers began to realize that actually cells from normal individuals could be, and this is now in the mouse model, could be injected into a lethally, lethally irradiated animal and uh, that these animals could live. But we were faced in that time with diseases such as leukemia that were totally uncurable. Patients came into the hospital, lived for a week or two, or three or four, and died. And one of these smart uh, individuals that we can sort of only look up to said, nuclear holocaust destroys bone marrow. Maybe we could destroy leukemia that way. And the experiments were done sort of in the mid-50s that at initially animals were irradiated and then injected with cells that were from normal animals. And for the first time in human nature and in uh, our culture, one could identify in an animal model that leukemia-free survival could occur. And for the first time at that moment, 
one could show that even in human, you could do a very short period of time, at least, of leukemia-free survival. And yet, you know, over the period of time, we were able to do this better and better. We have learned that there are multiple different ways of looking at different stem cell sources. Marrow first, peripheral blood second, cord blood right now. And you can see that this whole field has now really taken a major stay in our ability to handle patients with leukemia, lymphomas, myelomas. So there's a tremendous uh, mode of altruism in our uh, society that has uh, basically uh, been spawned through all these activities. So from our point of view, it's a major uh, procedure, and I'm really thankful that maybe our colleagues have started to tag on some of the things we were really puzzling about. Because when you look after a bone marrow transplant into multiple different organs, you can find donor-derived cells in the liver, in the central nervous system, in muscles, wherever you want to look. Whether they are just innocent bystanders there, or the way they do have a function, we don't know. But I think I, I do believe that eventually we will puzzle this together in a way that we can really use a stem cell procedure very effectively in the multiple different areas that we've talked today. Thank you very much.